there's nobody under the age of about 83 who can remember what life was like before the NHS. And people seem to assume that you can stop funding the NHS and somehow it will keep on going. And it's the same with Brexit. People assume that all the things that happened because we were in the EU would continue when we left the EU, and it haven't. People assume that you'd still be able to go to Europe without having a five-hour queue, and you'd still be able to get food. Food would still be cheap. And, you know, we'd still have all these rights and things. And everyone has forgotten that we have those things because of the stuff we put in place, because of the stuff we were paying for, because of the stuff that was costing us 18 pence a day each. Because, because of trade, because of trade unions, because people fought because for those rights. Union. The French yeah. still fight for the rights. The Germans, yeah. you know, they they watch their constitution, you know, carefully. They yeah. don't want to go into the kind of system that we've got now. Yeah. And uh, I mean, it is to me, it's a form of fascism anyway. Because once you've got the corporate bodies tying in with politicians and then a bent press, how do you vote you know, well? Your nineteen thirties Germany anyway, and it's not an exaggeration. You know, that, that was, I think I read Ian Dunt's book uh, just after the referendum. Um, and, and I just remember reading in that and thinking, because he, he actually spoke about Britain becoming a corporatocracy. Yeah. And if you think just the way that bills go up willy-nilly, they'll never come down again. You heard no. of the book Merchants of War? The old uh, book no. from the 1900s. Basically, it just doc it documents how people like Maxim made their fortune. Sir Hiram Maxim was the developer of the machine gun. As well as basically how um, capitalism drove war and that it was actually down to industry that was producing all of these like machine guns and tanks and everything else. And it wasn't actually governments anymore that were leading it. And that you had this new direction, which was essentially being pushed and funded by, by merchants of death. And we well, don't forget to just continued that all the way through. The, Ameri the American War of Independence, Thomas Paine warned against allowing big business to run the government. Yep. Watch yeah. out to keep them under wraps because it was how did the same thing. Of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military industrial complex. Well, yep. well yeah, well, they were leaving Washington's army starving. Yeah. You know, to let the price of uh, grain or whatever go up before they shipped it out. Yeah. They, were, they were actually, you know, the, these are the businessmen that were supposed to be back in the revolution. You, you realise we're heading in a slippery slope of conspiracies, because if we go down Eisenhower, the military-industrial complex, we get onto <laughs> Kennedy and the assassination. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another Sunday Roast. We have two wonderful guests back with us again. Uh, Terry, would you like to tell us a bit about yourself? And Oh, my God. I should be uh, drawing my pension, really. You know, I've been in the media now 43 years, and yet I still get people calling me a has-been. I'm thinking, how long do you want me to be around? Um, <laughs> so I, I'm, doing a, I'm doing a tour. The word is Terry Christian at the moment. I still do a radio show. Uh, I pop up on things. Somewhere back there, you'll see me Celebrity Mastermind Trophy, won before Christmas in Belfast and with a hangover too. So there you go. You know, I was I was in second place and then I was waiting for the person in first place to do the, the general knowledge round. And her first question is, what's the first letter of the Greek alphabet? And she said D. And I thought, I'm going to win this. <laughs> you know. Wonderful. Good to have you back again. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's fa fantastic. Uh, I mean, I do watch, I do watch all your stuff. I'm just not very good at the joining in bit. <laughs> Great to have you here, Russell. Can you tell us a bit about yourself for anyone who doesn't know you? Yeah, I'm Russell Jones, uh, Russ in Cheshire on Twitter, which I refuse to call X. And I've been in the media for about 43 seconds. Uh, basically, I, I started the media when I started this sentence. Um, uh, I'm uh, 30 years in software, and then accidentally became sort of a bit of a Twitter person. Uh, I hate the word celebrity, but apparently that's what I've become. And uh, I've written a couple of books. The first one is called The Decade in Tory, which is a, a list of the Tories. Well, it's not really a list. It's actually a, had a pr proper book with sentences. But it covers uh, the Tories from 2010 to 2020. And uh, my new book is out on the 21st of March, and that's called The Four Chancellors and a Funeral, and covers the downfall of Boris Johnson and drive-by Prime Minister Liz Truss. Uh, and the first 100 days of Rishi Sunak, uh, which were a pretty busy 100 days, although you may have forgotten it because it's been even busier since. You should have saved that for a third book. I've got a third book on its way. Oh, <laughs> right. I'm I'm right now. Cash, it, cash in while they're still in power. 
<laughs> Russ, can I can I ask well, what is probably the most shocking thing people will read in the book right. about the Tories? <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> um, the most shocking thing about the Tories. I don't know. The one that got me was uh, I, I stumbled on it by accident while I was researching the first book, and it was about the privatization of children's services for people who are in care homes. Um, and since they've been privatized, the the, the 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 reasoning behind the privatization was that it was going to save money. But the amount of money that the state is paying has actually increased by about 26%. We're paying 26% more to the private businesses than we did to local councils to provide the same services. And the private services have started offshoring the children to places that are cheaper so for example there is a place called the cherry i have to look it up it's called the cherry something care home which is in scotland and almost all the residents of it are from derbyshire because derbyshire council found it cheaper to send them to scotland it's a much cheaper place for them to go so these children who are in difficult situations are either in care they've been taken into care homes i suppose we would have called them all for these one days or they've or, they've had difficult childhoods and have been taken away from their families to be cared for, they've now been put 450 odd miles away to make more profits for people. Um, and that's what it comes down to, basically. It's just more profitable to put those children somewhere else. And in their documentation about it, they're referred to as outsourced units. Uh, these are children we're talking about. They're, they're referred to as outsourced units. So um, it's only a minor thing. It's basically one or two paragraphs in the middle of discussing something else. But I stumbled upon it and it absolutely shot me to the core because these are kids. Um, and if they've got any children, friends, relationships still in their area, they're dragged 450 miles away from them and dumped somewhere else in order to cherry blossom care home, that's what it's called. 450 miles away in order to make somebody in a venture capital business a little bit more money. It's just horrific, you know. Yeah. I mean, it is barbaric that that should be allowed to even go on. Well, I mean, this is just one time. This is a essentially what's happened over the last... 12, 14 years, is the atomization of society. It's been split up into tiny chunks and sold off. In the same way that before the financial crisis, mortgages were bundled and re re split up and sold off and turned into these, uh, these complicated financial instruments in order to make somebody more money and in order to hide what was actually going on and clever financial shenanigans. And the whole society has been put through this now. I mean, I was discussing with somebody this week, a friend of mine um, uh, lost her job before Christmas and she's got a new job now. And it's um, around about nine miles away from where I live here, which is in a small market town in, in Cheshire. It's the next market town long, it's nine miles away. In a car, it takes about 12 minutes to get there. But because public transport was privatized, the private businesses have closed down anything that's marginally profitable or not profitable enough concentrated on profitable routes. So now there is no way for her to get to the job that she's been given. She has to take the job or she'll lose her benefits. And these are benefits she's paid into during 30 years of taxable income. She's not allowed to have them because she turns down a job. But because of the lack of public transport, she has to get a bus from where she lives around about 22 miles to another town and then get another bus 22 miles back to the town that's eight miles away. And it takes her two and a half to three hours. So that's an extra six hours a day, and that means she can't see her kids, she can't see her pets, she can't have any kind of life. It's 14 or 15 hours a day out because there's no public transport. And this is the result of the atomization of society. These things have been pulled apart, packaged and resold to venture capital people who closed down the bits that they think are impossible. But it's all it's, it started in the 60s, didn't they? The Tories with the with the trains and the guy in charge of it all yeah. actually Beaching. was in the business of building motorways, yeah. wasn't it? But but it's but it's all then, for the country because we've currently got nine hundred thousand odd people who are trying to get back into work and the the government wants to get them back into work. But how can you do that? She's now spending a small fortune traveling 40 odd miles a day on a public transport when she could be traveling on one bus. And I did a little bit of research because that's what I do, and I looked into how much it would cost for a bus. And a standard bus that would fit 48 passengers costs around about £100,000 and will last around about 10 years. And each, each of those passengers is earning the minimum wage. It generates £2.7 million per year of tax revenue. So in order to save £100,000, we're losing £2.7 million. If we just invested in things like services, in the infrastructure that allows the country to run, the people would be able to go and get jobs. Right, but, it, but, it, but it's that Tory mentality of life as a zero-sum game. Yeah. If someone's got something, everyone has to suffer, because if someone's got something, it's something that I haven't got. 
and and they're just so weird like that. You know, talking about the kids being you know shipped up, up to Scotland. If you think about that, really, what what are the long term effects yeah. of that? Is they're going to end up having to be in prison, you know, or whatever. You know, they're, they're going to have mental health problems that cost society millions. Precisely, they're not really saving anything. So these are supposed to be the people who are in charge of business and, make, and the, 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 the economic geniuses. These, these are the people who know how to handle the economy. That's what we've been told for years. Mm. Well, listen, I, I've, 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 I've worked with what uh, Britain's public school boys have thrown up, and thrown up is the apposite phrase, and they aren't particularly bright. Well, the, the two and it's a good job the mum, the mum and dad... Love you me. too, Terry. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm generalising, but, you know, you can't always generalise, but you usually can, <laughs> you know? You brought that up with Sajid Javid in your book. We haven't introduced ourselves. I'm Alex, I'm a journalist. Hello, Alex. And this is Max. Max, can you introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Max. I run the Robespierre channel, and we're going to talk about British politics and Brexit in particular. Back back to you, Alex. You bring that up with Sajid Javid. He was he was putting all the he was compiling derivatives, wasn't he, from mortgages before he got in charge of Well, exactly. He was he was in charge of collateralized debt obligations That's at it. Deutsche Bank. Yeah, uh, Deutsche Bank Asia. I should be careful. I don't want to get sued for saying the wrong thing. But he was in charge. He was he was the director of it of uh, collateralized debt obligations in Deutsche Bank and collateralized debt obligations. I'll say CDOs because it's easier. But CDOs were the prime, uh, the prime financial instrument that brought down the international banking system. Yeah, and um, the uh, U.S. Senate said that Deutsche Bank's handling the, of, of CDOs was one of the major factors in the collapse of the international banking system in two thousand seven which wiped out trillions and put millions of people on the poverty line. And we're still dealing with the consequences of that now. I mean, that was one of the major drivers of what happened behind Brexit was the financial crisis. And it made people look for a different way of doing things. Um, but we'll pause. You know, that, we'll that, pause that, was, that was sad. Oh, no, no, it's, it's, it's just my youngest lad bringing me up. Let me let me switch that phone off. Yeah, you don't like him much anyway, do you, Terry? I know he's fine to speak to him all the time. He's just <laughs> flogged Imri Varadis on phones today. He's got a maths degree, but he's uh, he's had that that problem where because I just sent him to the local comprehensive, he's not you know, and it's a red brick uni degree, you know, from Sheffield. And he's a bright lad, got a great CV, but he's having to, you know, compete with Tarquin and Tristram. Yeah, buying their way to the front of the queue. Yep. Mm, well, shortcut. Yeah. But that's 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 the that's UK society. That's what it's been built on, and it's. It's a falsehood. It's it's one of those interesting things that you would never hear them talk about the word luck. They're in the right place at the right time, or their parents are in the right t- right place at the right time to get them in the access to something that'll benefit them. And yet, Do you know what not- words they, they never use? They never say fair, and they never talk about deserve. Didn't David Cameron though? Didn't he try and plug those two key words for a while? Suggesting that he wants to create a fair society, or was it? Like- yeah, yeah, but he, he did it with these scroungers versus strivers <laughs> yes, thing, yes. which was basically saying, you know, you know, I'm a striver, and look how well I've done. And he failed to mention how unbelievably wealthy his father was, and that he was helping people by tax, and they, they all do that. failed to mention that he was born to an aristocrat. <laughs> but, but the richer they are, the more they inherit, the harder they make out they've worked. You know, I mean, I did question time with Richard Tice. And he's just such a kind of nothing. Do you understand what I mean? He's a nothing. And it was like I said to him, I said, you did very well there, Richard, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps to inherit 500 million off your dad. (laughs) What did he say back? Well, well, he, he just ignores it. He just ignores it. Don't engage on that level. And then, then when he was getting off, I said, you know, well, hopefully when you leave politics, you'll have more time to spend with your trust fund. You know, (laughs) you know, the, 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 it's like George Romby said, if hard work made people rich, every woman in Africa will be a millionaire. All right. You know, it's it's not like people who are poor don't work hard. People who are poor work harder than anybody else. They're, they're constantly striving, constantly. <laughs> just going to the supermarket is an absolute bloody battle if you're poor. Can, uh, can, I, can, I, yeah, can I just say something? There was um, recently Sky News did a report um, where they were talking about Quasi Quartang. Yeah. And Quasi Quartang was being interviewed and they were mentioning him being interviewed. And they said that, well, he'll probably get a job in the city when he leaves <laughs> office. That, but like, if you just think about that, that's somebody who has crashed the economy yeah. Yeah. and he's going to be lined up for a job. Now, what's, what can he bring to the table? They said, well, it, he has experience and stuff like that. I think it's about contacts. It's about networking. They probably all had bets on, you know, yes. when he crashed the economy. <laughs> well, and cleaned uh, up. without wanting to go into it, 
it's all listen in here they actually did have bets they bet hundreds of millions crispy no day who was you know always behind oh, yeah. these things the hedge fund manager um he made a 270 million pounds by betting that the the trust quartang budget which was something he backed a week before he was placing bets that it would crash the economy uh, and he made 270 million pound of it just terrifying and it's not the only one there were hedge funders that, that, who were reporting and i can't remember the exact quote but it's in the book they were saying that uh, they were commenting that, about the difference you know it's they said it was hilarious the difference between the free marketeer what free marketers believe and what the free market actually wants they said it's hilarious but it's the gift that keeps on giving they just encourage these people to do these mad things, and then they bet that it's going to crash the economy. Make them but of course, the, but of course, that money comes from somewhere. And with, with that money, they then make donations back to the Conservative Party and encourage them to do it again. And it's a loop. And no, claim, but, it off, yeah. claim it off their tax, don't they? No, but, but, it, but it also, but it also yeah. comes from comes from society. So somebody down the line is suffering because of that. People with higher mortgages, people who are renting properties because mortgages are higher and landlords are charging more. So yeah. all of this, you know, what what these hedge fund managers make huge amounts of money it's further down the line somebody else is paying for well, it this is, this is one of the concerns i have about the, the idea of there being wealth generated we need to look after the people who generate wealth what they actually do is a whole bunch of people who generate wealth and they accumulate it and, and aggregate it all into one place and then say look how much money i've made and they haven't actually they've gone around the place and scraped it together and made a big pile the people who actually it's, generate wealth are the people it, who, who it's funny that you talked about quasi because in football or sports there's a general idea that you learn more from your mistakes than you do from your successes so does that mean that quasi quarter is going to become the next gary stevens genius <laughs> is, that, is, is, is that the reality he I, hasn't made so mistakes. many mistakes he, he's, he must be the best one it, it, i mean <laughs> the whole mistakes which is why he's so good at making them now but the whole you know, like, thing just just introduced a whole new level of letting right-wing rats out of the cage and people that are absolutely and totally inept. You know, you're going, I can't remember a worse government. I mean, I can remember it being bad. You know, like Thatcher was terrible. Absolutely awful. You know, she she was, I think it's Christopher Hitchens is, who described her as a, a, a someone who was posing as the, as the antidote to a catastrophe. She was a catastrophe posing as the antidote to a catastrophe. <laughs> and it, but, but it was like, you know, she wouldn't dare do what these have done because you had trade unions. The whole country would have been in flames had she done something. Uh, say what you like about Thatcher, and I, I probably would as well. But in her defence, she might have done evil things, but she did them competently. She was competent. Well, well, yeah, yeah but what I'm saying, she, she had to. She had to still deal with the unions. She yeah. spent money stupidly. She destroyed our industries. She destroyed our manufacturing. So we became a foreign-owned production line. She made everything about the city of London. Mm. You know, she sold off the council housing stock and wouldn't allow councils then to build new houses with the money they got from the houses that they sold at a discount. You could always buy your council house. You just didn't get the discounts on it. And so, she, and, and really, that was all about London because it was all Tory MPs and Tory mm -hmm. councils buying up all the prime council properties. They were literally knocking on people's houses to buy them and, and saying, and say, oh, I'll give you 60,000 for that. And, they, you know, and they, they were grabbing 60 grand and going off and buying a semi in Essex, not realising that that house that they'd sold, you know, in, you know, next to Westminster or in Islington or Highbury was, was going to be worth like a quarter of a million in, in the space of a year. But I, I think the problem the Conservative Party have now is, is the, the tiny pool that they're fishing from. And I don't just mean MPs and voters, it's largely the membership. Because the membership has shrunk so slow, so small, as with anything, when something's shrunk small, the only people who stay there are the people who are more and more extreme. But these are the ones who get to choose the candidates. And this this goes across all parties, really. If you allow your membership to get too small, a smaller and smaller group of more and more extreme people are the people who choose who become the MPs. So you look at the MPs that we have now, you look at the cabinet now, and you can pick on any of them, really. You can pick on any of them for the last 10 years. But if you compare them... And this isn't a party political issue. I'm not, I'm not mm -hmm. obviously I will make party political issues, but this is just a, a functional issue. If you look at um the way that the Thatcher cabinet, for example, in Thatcher cabinet, you had Douglas Hurd, Kenneth Clark, um, Virginia Bottomley. And these people were laughable at the time. They were jokes. God's sake, say what you mean. You're not on the platform now. <clears throat> Nigel pinched my pen. Nigel. He did, he did. Is this true? You know my policy on stealing from one's friends? Cabinet, 
Mm. What do we call it when people go around stealing other people's property? Oh. You! A, a free market economy? <laughs> Rubbish! <laughs> what do we call it, David? Socialism. Well done. You know, that's the, the, um, the, you know, um, what was it called? Baker, the, 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 the one that was famously portrayed as a slug on Spitting Image. But these oh, Douglas Hurt. Yeah, Douglas Hurd. You had John Major. I mean, John Major now, you, you look at him now, and he's a he's a pillar of moral certitude and, and a, a hugely intelligent and impressive MP compared with everybody who's in the cabinet. But under Thatcher, he was a second rater. He was a bumbling second rater compared with the Ken Clarks and people like that. Now, I don't agree with Ken Clark and much politically, but he was a towering political figure. And you look at what we've got now. They're useless. They're incompetent. They're incapable. They don't know what they're doing or why. I mean, I mean, it's actually terrifying that you know <laughs> Labour couldn't beat place. them they because there was a place. there was a touch of that you know within Labour at the time when you looked at who was on their front bench. You yeah. know, when, when they were in opposition, and you went, you know, yeah, all over the place. But when the, when the pool of people who are choosing the MPs shrinks too small, and all you have is extremists, you end up getting. Substantial MPs being elected. to be fair to the Labour Party, they'd lost like a third quit, didn't they? Yeah, that year, and that um, new front bench had to come in with a new influx, and that's a huge number of people to lose out of your team. With a lot, the same okay. with the Tories, the same it's justification because you still get a pick. Yeah, but I've still, still no big. idea why didn't Gordon Brown, you know, kind of co cooperate with the Lib Dems? Didn't you get why the impression that it was Nick Clegg going? No, we've got to go for the biggest party first. That's yeah. the impression I get. He it's went, crazy. well, the service has got a bigger number, so I've got to go and work with them. And you're like, great. Yeah. But you and they, shot, they shot themselves in the foot anyway, didn't they? I, I remember voting tactically in that election for the guy, you know, is the, the Lib Dem guy from Cheadle, Cheadle U, because I lived in Bramall at the time. And uh, what is it? He, he voted with the government on every single thing. I remember yeah. like, slacking him off when I saw him. I said, what was the point me voting for you tactically? You voted for the bedroom tax. You voted for everything. You'd have you'd have voted for stoning women if they'd have put it through. They, 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 they had no backbone. They had no principles. <laughs> you brought up Richard Tice earlier, so let's. We're going to move this on just a little bit. You brought up Richard Tice earlier. It's funny because Lee Anderson's obviously defected, so we're going to bring that up as well as the mm -hmm. racist comments. Did you say defected or defective? Yeah, well, <laughs> both, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> he um he he in October twenty three. I've got him on camera just slagging off Richard Tice as a pound shot for Arch. Like, yeah. Yeah. full on saying he's not got any charisma, he's an ass. he doesn't know what he's talking about, and he can't sell him, and you wouldn't go down the pub and have a pint. He also said that every time that uh, an MP changes party, there should be an automatic violence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but the, the weird thing is, I know, I know people who knew Lee Anderson from way back, and actually his family weren't the scabs during the during the uh, miners' strike. So they didn't mm. scab, whereas a lot of Nottinghamshire miners were the scabs. A scab, also known as either a strike breaker, sometimes pejoratively called a scab, black leg or knob stick, is a person who works despite a strike. Because they, they had the better paid and safer jobs, you know, their minds weren't as kind of, you know. and But it was weird because, they, you know, they, they, were, they were kind of against... The general, you know, the, the miners' union, you know, Scargill, a lot of them, and they opted out and formed their own, you know, the Union of Democratic Mine Workers or whatever. They're sort of Tory miners, although they still got stitched and lost, lost all their jobs. But yeah, apparently Lee Anderson wasn't wasn't one of them, and nor his family. They weren't a scab family. So to go from that to this now, joined in reform. Yeah, you know, he's not. You wouldn't have him on your quiz team, but. It'd be great yeah, if him, him and Tice had a scrap. <laughs> <laughs> well, Steve, Bray almost got in a, Steve Bray almost got in a fight with him, didn't he, when he stole his hat? You're benefiting from them. It's a new year. Happy New Year. But you've not got a new job yet, have you're you? Still Same a, old job. You're I, still a parasite. You're I still a stranger. You and you're still a malignant. Nice well, Steve got people to see the same employment, <laughs> isn't it? Get off. Get off. Get off! Oh, and, and there's that footage of, of him punching a disabled person at the uh, Tory party conference the year before last. What? Have you seen that? No. 
Oh, you should look it up. He, he was asked. Uh, there were, I think it was, were they called the Disabled Something Alliance? I can't remember what they're called. If you Google it, Lee, Lee Anderson. And they're chanting, they the, the were chanting something like Tory cuts cost lives or something along those lines. Mm. And a member of the Disabled Alliance went up to him and said, have you got anything to say? And you saw him sort of look around as if there's any witnesses and then boom, <laughs> and knocks the guy's camera out of his hand. Tory lies cost people's lives. Tory lies cost people's lives. Tory lies cost people's lives. Got anything to say for yourself? And, and he's, he's being filmed punching a disabled person two years ago, and nobody seems to have noticed it. No, nobody. It's on. It's on Twitter. Go and look for it. Look, look for the evidence of punching someone, and you'll find it. That's insane. Christian yeah, for a living. That, that's the thing. It, it's it's amazing. The the thing is that it, I was saying before we started, uh, we, we were talking. He, he was he was people. Russ Russ. He was wrong. Okay. We'll just leave it at that. Yeah. He was wrong. <laughs> for those for those who just joined us, before we started, we were talking about um, you know the the fact that people are overwhelmed by the incredible amount of stupid and incredible things that have happened. It just it beggars belief how many things have happened and, and the speed at which they happen. And it's difficult to keep people to keep a grasp on it. And there's two things I want to say. First of all, is there's a quote by um, Gary Kasparov, the great chess grandmaster that says and i might be paraphrasing slightly here in which case i apologize i think he says something along the lines of the purpose of modern propaganda is not to spread lies it's to make you doubt the existence of there being something such as truth it's to overwhelm the critical capacity and make you doubt that truth can possibly exist and that's what's happened we, we end up with people regardless of what you think about right? they end up with people even the very good the, the better media outlets can't keep up with the number of lies Mm. And they don't they can't fact check them fast enough. And the number and the speed and the 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 tsunami of lies and, and events that wash over people. And it's made them it's made it impossible to fact check people in real time. No matter how hard you try, it can't be done. And the second thing I want to say is that, and I've got this in front of me as well, so I'm gonna read this verbatim. This is something that uh, Boris Johnson said in 2006. I've got a brilliant new strategy, which is to make so many gaps that nobody knows which one to concentrate on. They cease to be newsworthy. You completely outgeneral the media in that way, and they despair. You shell them. You pepper the media. You've got to pepper their positions with so many gaps that they're confused. It's like a helicopter shot throwing out chaff, and then you steal in quietly and drop your depth charges wherever you want to drop them. I've got a brilliant new strategy, which is to make so many gaffes that nobody knows which one to concentrate on. So they cease to be newsworthy. They cease to be, they, they cease to be newsworthy. You, you completely outgeneral the media in that way, and they, they, they despair. They just better. And, 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 yet, and so what you do, you, 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 they leave you alone, you shell them, you pepper the media. What you do is you've got to, you got, you, you got to pepper their positions with so many gaffes that they're confused. It's like chaff, it's like a helicopter throwing out chaff. And then you steal on quietly and drop your depth charges wherever you want to drop them. And I think that's exactly what they've done. They've basically swamped the media with catastrophe and made it impossible for people to notice these things, which is why... Lee Anderson can punch somebody on camera and nobody notices. Remember the, the time, was it 2016, when a member of the government um, attacked a Green protester at a black tie ball? Can we get this patch now? On camera. And he was, that was it, he was out immediately. Like the next day, there was no denying it. I can't remember what his name was now. It's, it's slipped my mind. But the fact of the matter is that only three or four years later, you can get Lee Anderson, who was later made into the deputy chairman of the Conservative Party, punching a disabled protester on camera. No, I mean, none of us even know. You know, you three didn't even notice it. He, he was like the he was like the chief surf, wasn't he, Lee Anderson? Yeah. You know, to, to sort of lead that. And I mean, you still get people who kind of look up to him and you go, but you saw him say. No, pretend you don't know me, mate. Yeah. <laughs> right it's away. You should be finished. It's you should be finished. It's, it's, yeah, you know, it's, it's like, who, who's going to respect someone like that? He's already shown himself up to be an absolute lowlife. But, but, it's, but it's like, um, as always the case, and maybe Russ can confirm this, it's, well, they hate the same people as I hate. And that's all that's yeah. important. Yeah. Mm. Which brings us on to racism. Well, yeah. 
I mean, because I, I think that's the reason yeah, why nice UNAP has been unable to do anything about the racism accusations and this Islamophobia. Uh, you know, we need to be a bit careful because I'd, I, I've already been threatened with lawsuits before now by being slightly careless about the other things that I say. Uh -huh. so, <laughs> so alleged racism, alleged Islamophobia. But, you know, the fact of the matter is that Sunak can't come out and say it's Islamophobia. He just says it's wrong. Yeah. Because... I, I mean, it's a strange one, though, isn't it? You know, because why don't they just call it Muslimophobia? Because it's Muslims you don't like. Do you know what I mean? It's not yeah. to call it. Is it's a bit like if I, you know, if if someone said I was Catholicophobic. Well, I am because I don't particularly like the Catholic Church. But mm. all my best mates and my family, who I love, are kind of you know Catholics or lapsed recovering. Mm. So it's a That's it is a bit of a strange man. one. I have to say, you know, and I, I, I'm a bit uncomfortable with the phrase. Well, I, I think it's, I think it's the dehumanization. So if if you say I'm, well, I'm Islamophobic, it's you're against the religion, but you're not against the people. But if you say Muslimophobic or something like that, then you're against the people. So, but they are think, against the people, well, of course, the thing, yeah. But, but they, but they'll say it. They'll try and spin it as, as no, no, it's not the people. We've. It's like when it came to city. Yeah, yeah, it but, like, it, but it makes it a bit muddy because if yeah, you yeah. then criticize something you don't like in a religion then people can accuse you of being phobic about that religion. Mm. So mm. It's, it's a different, I think it's a different thing to racism. I think mo what most Muslims in this country suffer from is racism. Yeah, I agree. You know, so it's, it's because they've got, you know, they've got brown skins. It's most of the skin. in this country, are, you know, a Pakistani or a Bangladeshi, you know what I mean? So you will get them from North Africa and elsewhere, but in the main, that's the one. I doubt very much if there are many people who are Islamophobic who make a really big dif big differentiation between Islam and Sikhism. Well, they, they won't care. They don't, they don't care, care anyway. Skin color, no. right? They just say the same. They just shout the same horrible insults at people who've got that color skin. I'm aware yeah. of journalists embedding themselves in white right wing groups in the UK. Can't name names, but I'm aware that they are, and they're coming back and saying that they're having de these right wing, far right wing groups are having debates about whether or not to be racist to Jewish people or to have them on site. And you're going, this is just, this is some sort of level of crazy. Right, well, it depends on which conspiracy theories they're buying into, doesn't it? So you, you, you've got that. So this is where, again, the far right are split on this, aren't they? You know, so, you know, on the Palestine question, because depending on what kind of conspiracy theories and all the rest of it that they're into, they're, they're, they're taking opposite sides. Uh, yeah. You know, it's it's just so odd. It is like something out of a Judge Dredd comic out there. It's like a, there's a kind of anarchy going on in well, people's it's, minds. It's, I mean, I've never known, and I grew up in the 60s, 70s, 80s, when there's so much racism around. I witnessed it. I witnessed it in the BBC. I witnessed it where I worked. But I've never known it to be a daily topic the way it is. And you're going, well, actually, most people don't really care. Young people don't care anymore. You know, what is the big... You know, or they want to get rid of us all. I said, well, so what if all your grandkids are black? Will it make any difference? They'll still be in a, the equivalent of Power Rangers or whatever else. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I find it quite interesting. that If you go back to about 2007, 2008, and there was a big rise in the support for the British National Party. And then Nick Griffin went on question time and got torn to pieces. And the BNP essentially vanished overnight. And by 2012, I think it was, they had to pay £75 to remain a, a registered as a political party and they couldn't afford it. <laughs> so, and they vanished. But as the trajectory of their following went off, off a cliff, the trajectory of people who supported UKIP rose. And as UKIP fell, reform rose. And I'm not saying for a second that everybody who supports UKIP and everyone who supported um, reform are racists. But BNP got, at one point, in some areas of the country, about 16% of the vote. At some local elections, they got, I think it was around 16%. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's unfair to suggest that those 16% of people didn't suddenly change their mind and stop being supporters of British nationalism. They just shifted their vote somewhere else and they went to UKIP and then they went to reform. And some of them will have died off, so reform are currently on about 9%. But I don't think it's an unrealistic thing to suggest that lots of people who would once have supported the BNP on everything apart from knifing people, they supported everything they were into apart from the knives. Now they supported, they supported UKIP because they had basically the same series of policies, basically the same objectives, basically the same petty recrimination and, and stagnant little annoyances about people being brown in Tesco and, oh look at that Irish person there, I don't like them, and, oh look, he's too Jewish, and all those things that drove the BNP absolutely mad. 
it's the same petty, nasty little. Can, can, can I ask? Can I ask a question? If if the BNP were around today, would they be doing well? Because I I think the app the the environment today is potentially worse than 20, 2006, 2007, because you have the likes of GB News, Talk TV. Um, social media is a lot different now. Um, a lot of these voices get amplified. And if reform was not around, do you think the BMP will be in their position? I don't think they need to be. No, I agree. I, th I think if you look at what Lee Anderson said, then you got Frank Hester. So Speaker of the House didn't let Diana speak about the topic that she was... Because there, there wasn't time. They had to talk about rugby and they had to talk about, there was another topic, <laughs> uh, World War II. Mark Francois brought up a question about World <laughs> War II. Yeah, you know, because World that's War more II. important. Th there was a little, I, I believe there was a question about rugby teams brought up in the House of Commons. So so what what was that about? Because Diane Abbott's come out and hit Labour and the Conservatives. Lindsay Hoyle, I mean, you know, we were talking about bad moves. He's done it twice in what? Three, four weeks? Because he had the whole thing with the SNP and now he's had this. And you're going, what on earth is going on? I, th I think I think he's trying to kind of, you know, make sure that he that he goes on the honours list, unlike Burkhoff. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, you know, he's he's kind of, you know, angling for that. So he doesn't want to upset the people who can kind of, you know, sign him off when they lose their jobs. You know, his retirement honours list for Rishi Sunak. Here you go. Well done. But so he, every speaker, every speaker gets made a law. It's just normal. The only one that didn't was Burko. Which is crazy, isn't it? Yeah. But but it's like Ho uh, Hoyle seems more upset if people are not wearing a tie or if they're calling Boris Johnson a liar than actually. It's, it's, he, 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 lacks, to... he lacks any kind of charisma, really. I mean, I mean, do you know how I know that? Is I remember everyone I met and I went, it was a Labour Party conference I was at years ago and I found an old card, Lindsay Hoyle, you know, MP for Chorley, Conservative. I don't know what he was doing at the Labour Party conference, but there you go. And I just thought, I don't remember you. And mm. that's kind of, that's that's how little little there will have been about him. Wasn't that the same with Burko though before he came speaker? They do tend to pick people that are just a bit I don't know. He's got a bit more personality though, hasn't he? He's got a bit more presence about him. I just don't think Lindsay Hoyle's got much presence. No, not the same. But then Burko was how was how long how many years was Burko in? 10, 14? Eight, 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 eight. So could, I just, just mean his general demeanor, you know. You, you kind of, if, if, you'd, if, you'd, if you'd met Burko, you would have an opinion about him. He's not yeah, yeah. a bland personality. Whereas, like Hoyle, I couldn't remember it. Sort of the neutral, well, I mean, in many ways, that's almost the perfect speaker. You don't, you just want them just being sort of guiding the, but, the but one of the things as opposed to Burko, a problem, who really effed off the, the Conservative Party. Go on, Max. But, but, uh, yeah, no, but a problem was I saw an interview with uh, Hoyle, and his response to one of the questions was, well, what we need to do is keep a balance between the theatre and the holding of ministers to account. And I was tearing my hair out because that's not what it's about. It's not about theatre, it's no. about holding ministers to account. And yeah. he was like, yeah, we need to keep the balance, make sure it's entertaining. It's not meant to be entertaining. It's, it's wow. meant to be a, a, a place where ministers answer questions. Of course, they don't. Sorry, Russell, you wanted to say something. Did I? I will do if you like. <laughs> no, um, I was just looking up because you were talking about BMP earlier. So as is my way, I just had a quick check. And in the 1970s, there was a National Front poster. The National Front obviously transformed into the BMP. There was a National Front poster listing the, the, the main policies, and it read, stop immigration, reject the common market, restore capital punishment, <laughs> make Britain great again, scrap overseas aid, rebuild armed forces. Now, five of those are now conservative policies, and all six are reform policies. So you're asking uh, whether well, the BMP well, needs to exist. Yeah. And also, the interesting thing is, the National Front were very anti-Irish, whereas the BMP... Bought the Irish in because they're white as well. They're more there inclusive. Is, there is an offshoot yes. of the BMP, which is the Housing Party, and they're vicious, yes. absolutely full on vicious in what they say yeah. and who they want in the country and who they don't want in the country. But it also it goes back to that thing. It feels like the Conservative Party just let people in without checking and didn't care, and even if they do say racist stuff, they won't even give the money back. I mean, that's a joke. Is that like you don't but, say well, they can't, like, but they can't give the money back because he's the biggest donor, I believe. And so and also, it, it's how much money they've got him. He's tied into everything. They can't get rid of him. He's he's got all our data, hasn't he? 
And they just found from the NHS done, and stuff. And yeah. They just found out that he's donated another five million that they for, forgot about when they were talking about it <laughs> yesterday. Oh, we forgot about that five million. I can't remember how many times I've forgotten about that film. And how, how many hundreds of millions has he made already out of the contracts? Four hundred, was it? Oh, I mean, it's just it's just crazy. You know, we're showering all these people with public money. Well, and then we're the going, thing, oh, we've, got, we've got no money for the NHS. We've got no, no money for this. We can't have public funding of political parties because it undermines democracy. We can't, you know, we have to have private donors. Mm-hmm. You can't make it publicly funded. It's unfair if you do it that way. But it's surprising how often a government, and I won't necessarily say which government, but a government gives a large contract to a, a provider and then that provider makes a large donation to the government. And if that's not publicly funding political parties, I'm not sure what is. It's just but, corruption. You know, I, I mean, why, 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 why be mealy mouthed about it? You give me 10 million back. <laughs> but then it goes back to, I mean, it goes, this This then leads into Russia. Why, uh, if, if I was a if I was a bad dictator and I wanted to mess with the UK, all uh, and this is before they got rid of the golden visa, all I've got to do is turn up, send some of my minions, keep their families in my home country, send the minions out with millions of pounds, tell them if they don't do as I say, I'll execute their family. They go in, they go and say to the government, we're going to invest loads of money. They look at their record. It's nice and clean because as a dictator, I can choose what's on the record or not, or I can pick people who've got clean records. They move into the country, they get a passport. They then invest into companies as they promised. MPs listen to them because they always want to have an industry set up in their territory. So, because it, it creates jobs. I think one factory, one large factory can create like 10 sub companies within the area. So MPs are always desperate for that. You then go, right, well, I've set up a business, I've got a passport, I've got millions of pounds. Now I can start funneling it into a party, pick the people I want. This is, I mean, that's what I could do as a bad guy. I could probably still do that as a bad guy if I pick the right country. Like that, that's, that's, that, that, that's obvious, literally what Russia did. That's what Putin did. It's a no brainer because I, I could literally take, a, and Max, you said this perfectly in the past, donating to the Tory party is the best investment you can get. Hester puts in 10 million, he gets 400 million in contracts. That's that's genius investment, and that's awful, awful think, politics and democracy. And I don't think there's any difference with what Putin did. We could list up all the donations. Just in order to make sure Carter Rock don't come down on us like a ton of bricks, I think we should be careful <laughs> and saying that it doesn't actually work that way around. What tends to happen is that you give, ten, you, you get, you, the, you, you can't get cause and effect in the right order. You have to get cause and effect in the wrong order, or else it's corruption. You can't say, I'll give you £10 million and you give me £300 million. You have to get the £300 million first and then say, I've decided now to give £10 million. Oh, you have secret, <laughs> me- secret meetings with all the newspaper people. No, we don't have secret meetings. Been doing. Terry, we don't have <laughs> secret Unminited, meetings. That's... Unminited meetings. That, that, that never happens, obviously. But well, no, just had a load, fact, it never happened Sooner. in that order. You have to be very careful or else Carter Rupp will come and get you. So, he's, you know. he's had more- more meetings with Murdoch and the Daily Mail and all that than he has with the housing ministers. Yeah. Right. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Great work if you can get it. Yeah. Can we all run for Parliament? Get rich. No. Rich. The last <laughs> thing you need me is being in charge. I'd, I'd be absolutely useless. I don't want to, I, don't, I don't like going Could out. You be any worse? Could you be any I... worse than Quasi Quarteng <laughs> or Liz Trust? Could you actually seriously say you could be any worse than that? It wouldn't be somebody disabled I'd be punching. <laughs> And it'd be within about a week. This challenge yeah, is not yeah, yeah, by yeah, I would, I'd, I'd, I'd be too triggered for that. You know, all those memories of growing up poor are too visceral for me. And to yeah, be able right. to see them, it was bad I when I first started on the radio. I remember interviewing Keith Joseph when he was like 21, one of my first radio shows. He could feel the hatred coming from me. It wasn't a balanced interview. And on the BBC as well, good radio in those days. <laughs> it's all gone downhill since then. It has. <laughs> Too bland. <laughs> well, I mean, again, bring your book back in, another plug. You read the list of people at the beginning of the book and you're going, that was the best of the bunch. And you're going, Hancock, Javid, Osborne, <laughs> Lenson. And you're going, oh my God, that that was the best that they had. And it's just gone downhill in terms hey, of... But I, I think... And Grant- in terms of racism. There's no, there's no arguing about it, and no one seems to want to pull, pull it together and and stop the division. It's just continued, and it's it's pretty much continued ever since Brexit. Look at the hate crime numbers; they've just continually gone up. And it's and you could see that you could see the newspapers backing this, and it's just a repetition, repetition, repetition of of the same thing until people listen straight out of 
Yeah, I, I think Terry wants to talk about Grand Shaps. No, no, I was going to say that they don't, they don't, they don't give a, a sh an SHIT, do they, about all that stuff? And that's probably why Grant Shaps is still in there. I thought you were no, going to say he's, 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 Yeah, no, he <laughs> is the, the all-time sign that no one really gives a sh, do they? Grant Shaps, I mean, I, come on. I don't know how he survived. Uh, is it 16 ministerial roles he's had since 2007? Like just, and, and he's been useless at everything. He's almost Ever like, you know, that, that crap footballer in your team squad that they don't see it. <laughs> he's like the Phil Jones, isn't he? I mean, no, he was good when he was fit, Phil Jones. But you know what I mean? Phil Jones is at United. I, I, I don't know. Years. I don't know if I don't know if you use this expression in Britain, but um, Terry probably knows that he's harmless. So in Ireland, we say somebody's <laughs> harmless. It's yeah, like well. you can put them into any any position. They're not going to. Either, they're not going to improve. They're not going to get any worse. But they're not going to really do. Oh, anything. I think he's going to get. He's, he makes things worse. <laughs> I mean, he's just. Well, his nickname among the Conservative Party is the Minister for Radio Four. Because he's considered to be one of these guys that you can always say, "Will you go on the Today program this morning?" And he goes, "Yeah, okay," and he charges off and does the Today program. He lets people tear him apart, and he makes a fool of himself. And he comes back and thinks he's done a good job, and all the rest of them hide in the background, diligently pulling the organs of the state apart as they always have done. While Grant Chaps goes off and does his thing, and then six months like, they shuffle him into another ministerial position, and he goes off and does the same thing again. And you know, but he, do, he doesn't rock the boat, does he? So it'd be a yeah, Boris he man, it'd be a yeah. Sunat man, it'll be a you know a Theresa May man, it'd be whoever's whoever's in there, he'll be the right hand creep. Yeah. It doesn't do anything. He's done the opposite of the world as transport secretary. He has done nothing. I would ask him what on earth he's been doing for the last nine months. No airport testing, screening, or measures since the pandemic began. None. No temperature checks, no health assessments, no flight restrictions throughout this entire pandemic. No measures to have air travel actually acknowledge we're in a pandemic. The lack of measures have contributed to the worst death toll in Europe, and he detailed what every other country has been doing. So I'll put it to you. What have you done? When was the last time you... you can anybody... And, and, you know, this is for the viewers out there as well. Can anybody remember a policy that Grant Chaps has suggested and put into place? There you go. Wasn't there some not, like, the... 14 years <laughs> without effect? I, I'm thinking the was because when he used to do a column in the Sunday People, he came up for some reason. But again, it was something to do with how stupid he was and how stupid he thought everyone else was to believe what he was saying. Didn't yeah. he suggest that the aircraft carriers were were part of the British Air Force? I think there was something along those lines. And when he was trying to defend the mine ships driving into each other, and although in, in, I don't in think you can put that his... on as a policy, though, can you? No, you can't. <laughs> well, didn't, didn't he have, well, unless he wanted the... to transfer. <laughs> Didn't he have the minimum service level that he wanted to bring in? I think that was him when he was under transport. But then there was no staff, so they couldn't bring in the minimum it. service well, That's level. what I mean. Everything he suggests, everything he tries, everything he does. <laughs> I can't remember. And, you know, as you can probably tell by the thickness of the book, I spent a bit of time looking into this. I can't find anything he's actually done. All wow. he does is go on Radio 4 and get punched by the presenters. And then he goes back to his office and everyone else pats him on the head and tells him he's a good boy, gives him another ministerial position and sends him out to do it again. And he's been doing that for 14 years. It's just doing dreadful. The whole thing's dreadful. You know, I mean, it's... I don't know. I can't... Hey, thank God I, I've qualified for an Irish passport and so do me, kids. <laughs> you, know, you, you can escape. Ready. I have people going, come on, Twitter. Oh, I thought you were going to Ireland. I said, well, no, I don't have to go to Ireland. I've got an Irish passport. It just gives me options. <laughs> if I've actually got any money left after what you lot have done to it. Yeah. Have you Have you ever come close to losing it with someone on on screen, I've seen you on Good Morning Britain getting as close to it, your head exploding. As that oh no, no, that I mean, I mean that that time on Good Morning Britain. I mean, you've got several irritations on Good Morning Britain. You've got Richard Maidley, where he, he asks these long statements with a question mark on the end, which I wouldn't let him do when we were doing. Uh, I think we were doing the should MPs have two jobs, and he started doing that. I said, right, uh, quickly, listen, uh, no, no, no need for all of this, Richard. Uh, yes, they they should they shouldn't have more than two. They should they shouldn't be allowed to have two jobs unless it's for the social good. Because he was going into this long one. He was going to say, and then they're a nurse. I don't give a shit. You know what I mean? So and he, he said, well, let me finish my question. I said, it's, there's no need to. I've just said my bit now. Now move on to uh, whoever it was in there on it. Um, the one that really really was weird was they put me on with Mark Francois about Brexit as Brexit finished Britain. Well, I mean, he's a you know he's he's like a complete brainless idiot. So everything he said was just, so I just thought I'll, I'll interrupt him and niggle him, you know. 
But then, of course, Piers Morgan didn't like that. So then he dived in and then thought he could shout me down. And it ended up with that. Well, I was a fourth of six kids in a big Irish family. <laughs> you know what I mean? Good luck with that one. So I had like, at the end, I had Susan, Susanna Reid, Piers Morgan and Mark Francois all trying to shout me down. And I wasn't going to go for it. You know. hey. Oh gosh, yes, I do. I do really hate Morgan. You know, yeah. Well, it's, it's I mean, halfway, I... halfway between a sneer and an. <laughs> Does that count? As, uh, <laughs> that counts swearing. That's literally who he is. Time, it was a long time ago, and uh, and uh, you know what? My life is better. Oh no, he, he is just a slime boy. I mean, I, I I've dealt with him since nineteen. Morgan or Francois? He's, oh no, Morgan. Morgan. Francois is nothing. He's not even worth thinking about. Morgan. <laughs> Is an absolute slime ball, and now it's like the hat. I remember it, when he first interacted with me on Twitter. I mean, I've known him since 1990, he was obsessed with me. He actually put, Oh, you've crawled out from under your, your rock again. I said, Thank, Thanks for that, Piers. It's uh, not as big a rock as yours, is it? I said, <laughs> Hey, and then I went, Phone hacking, house of cards, that one, isn't it? I didn't say it's for him, but you know, everyone knows it. You know, I knew it. Mine, mine definitely got done. Oh, did you it? Know? Oh, well, listen, it got done by the sun and probably by the mirror too. I didn't need the proof for the sun. Did you, did you ever hear yeah, about... We shouldn't really... We should, well, you have to sign your confidentiality stuff. Jeez. You know, but... Wow. I mean, you know, I, I've listened to... I was Obviously, uh, I've listened to Paul Gascon talk about it. That was horrific. He said he ended up not trusting anyone because he thought people, he thought friends and family were leaking yeah, yeah. personal information, which made him go, I can't even trust my parents. I mean, that's just one of the stories. I mean, it's like... well, 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 I mean, my life was boring anyway. What, what used to happen, they'd make stories up about me, you know, the actual PR team from the word, you know, and they say, Terry's gone into hiding and stuff like that, which, you know, yeah, right. And then Piers Morgan would ring me up on my landline at home. <laughs> I believe you're in hiding. When? <laughs> oh, you mean at me? At house, with, all my, with all my mates around watching United on Sky, I was an early adopter. That <laughs> you know, works on the telly. Um, so the, you know, it, it was strange things like that. But I mean, the whole system is corrupt, and the, and it, it it's kind of been let go. You know, this should have been like bought into line years ago. We, we'd become a, a, a banana republic, basically. You know, the UK then, is like a banana republic. Well, a banana monarchy. Then I I think it's always been there. I think it's just not been as known because we had money. I mean, I, I'd say that the seventies, from what I've read and listened to and everything else, until we joined the EU, we just looked like a we were in stagflation. We couldn't get out of this. Well, well, no, because well, he, 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 and what it was was before we joined the EU, not not everybody had a fridge, not everybody had a phone, but what everybody had was a house, or most people had a house, you know, a council house. Or hmm. I mean, we got our council house, you know, because the private slum that we lived in got demolished and we held out, you know, the last one on the street, you know, surrounded by rubble and overrun with rodents. And so we got the house that we wanted, you know, a council house, because obviously, you know, my parents are Irish. So they didn't, they weren't top of the list in those days, even though they had like six kids. And, you know, so things have changed, but people had jobs, you know, want my dad's wage more or less fed us all. You know, you would panic. Mm. I remember yeah. panicking when the Tories got in because it was small margins. And what I didn't want to be was on free school dinners at the posh grammar school I went to. You know, I went to St. Bede's. I passed me 11 plus. But, you know, when, when the Tories got in, there's going to be less money for your dad. You know, the three-day week, it's a nightmare. It was an absolute nightmare. And those things are visceral for people. But in the 70s, you still had more. You could still do more. Football was cheap. You know, yeah. going to the pitches was cheap. Having a pint was cheap. People went out every night, even if it was just for two pints. Now they, they've got no social life anymore. They've got nothing. Do you good. think do you think Labour can fix this then if they come in? They need to do something. But I mean, you know, where, where do they even start? You know, Blair got criticised a lot by me. I wouldn't even get on board with the Cool Britannia thing because I thought, oh, he's just a Tory. But the reality was, you look at the absolute disaster and mess he'd inherited from Thatcher and from Major. And he managed to sort out the unemployment. He managed to sort out Northern Ireland. He sorted out Serbia. You know, so, I mean, not him, but that Labour Party. They got... It'll be a lot worse this time, though. Oh, much, think, much worse. I think the inheritance that Keir Starmer will have is going to be the worst one that we've had for 250 years, really. But then it needs something drastic doing. And, yeah, and that's a wealth, a wealth I mean, tax. I mean, yeah, well, something drastic 
land value tax, to... wealth tax, something like that. Land, oh, yeah. land value taxes should have been in years ago. They don't even get discussed in this country. Yet everywhere else in the world, they tax yeah. land. Yeah. You know, it's the most valuable asset you can own. It's yeah. a non-taxable asset, yeah. and you can't hide that off. You can't hide a million acres off offshore, can you? No. But that's Absolutely. what they're terrified of. They're terrified of land taxes. Yeah. Which it seems like that'd, a sensible that'd reheat, that'd reheat the economy more than flogging flogging a few million council houses. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I was listening to a really interesting discussion on that. A, a YouTuber, I can't remember who it was, brought it up, but they were pointing out there's a station in London that hasn't been developed and it's just sat there untaxed by, I think, a Russian oligarch. And he then pointed out all the other shops in the area, I think it's Brompton Station, I think, and then he pointed out that all the other shops in the area had done themselves up, made themselves look better, brought people into the area, but on top of that, they paid their tax. But he'd done nothing with the station, but because everyone else had worked their butt off to get the area up and running again, that meant that his station had gone up in value. So by doing no work and just sitting on the land, he had made himself a fortune through everyone else's efforts. Yeah. I think that well, I mean, really summarised land like, tax quite well. It's like it's like you lot down south made a fortune with your property based on northern taxes paying for your transport infrastructure. You so that you can have a nice this. tube line. So that you can have a nice tube line going out to you know Slum Central in in <laughs> Essex <laughs> or whatever, and then suddenly those house prices have doubled. We're paying for it. Meanwhile, you know we're paying about five quid to go two stops on the bus. Well, you you say all of this, Labour, a couple of weeks back came out and said that London's paying for Scotland? Scotland has benefited and continues to benefit. So, for example, from every year, Scotland has a net benefit of um, £10 billion of a fiscal transfer. That's equivalent of the entire NHS budget in Scotland. You know, London essentially generates the wealth and it's redistributed to other regions of the UK. Because it I've makes no £10 billion what you're talking about now. Yeah, Yeah, but I mean, I'm talking about in terms of us as taxpayers, we don't see it, you know, this idea no, of no. levelling all get spent in the south. Yeah, because and, London, and, this is a London centric view. I 100% well, agree with. Well, you. Yeah, yeah, but what I'm saying is that if you build the infrustructure, a place becomes more wealthy. Yeah, you know, you know, it's, like, it's like people people are like, you know, dying in places like Burnley. You hmm. build a good a decent line there, you should be able to get to Burnley in 25 minutes. I have an idea. Yeah. On, we, need, right. we need I'm to spend big... about we need to spend oh. about 12 billion pounds to fix the Palace of Westminster. That's what it's estimated at. Well, bear in mind, it's estimated by the government that, that said HS2 would cost £31 billion. So I'm going to guess it's going to be twice that. So let's make that assumption that that's what they were actually talking about. To fix the Palace of Westminster, which is falling into the Thames and rat-infested and full of asbestos and unusable, let's just assume it's going to cost about £20 billion. And I think we should not spend it. I think we should sell it and we should sell all the government buildings that are around it and should build a new parallel building somewhere on the HS2 line Stoke, Birmingham, somewhere like that. A new parallel building that's circular, so we don't have this confrontation. Oh, the dead centre of Britain, which is in between Carlisle and Newcastle, isn't it? Somewhere like that. Somewhere use a nice, use a Nightingale hospital that was yeah, <laughs> not in storage that. somewhere. We should also, instead of having all of the government departments all surrounding the parallel building, we should spread them out all over the country. We should have the Treasury should be sent to Tony Pandy, and the Department of Defence should be in Dover and. Oh, Latry Sam, that's where the Royal Mint is, isn't it? Spread yep. them all around the country and make the civil servants and the ministers go there and work there and live there. If they don't want to go there and live there and work there, that's absolutely fine. There's lots of jobs in London they can get a different job and we'll employ people in those areas to do it. And then they will say, hang on a minute, where's the good schools? Where's the opera? Why can't I get a decent meal? Why isn't the transport <laughs> working? And suddenly you'll find... They'll be making decisions about where infrastructure spending is made that is not all based around what's within two and a half miles of Westminster. Tony Wilson was saying back in the seventies and early eighties oh, about him. the media. You know what I mean? Next door to him. Yeah. Is, it, is it is it is it a bit like increasing MPs' wages? The people who will decide. Well, not exactly, but it's a bit like asking the people of London to say, "Okay, we're going to forego money for London to help the North." I, 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 I hate to be an, a pessimist, but I don't see it actually working because the people who will have to make the decision will be Westminster and they were like, yeah. no, we don't want yeah, to change yeah, anything. Yeah. Well, you say, I mean, Brazil did it. It was originally, was it? Oh, Brazil, yeah. And they moved to Brazilia and in Australia have done it. I did a week uh, filling in on Six Music back in about 2004 
And I had to pay for my own train fare and my own hotel in London to stay over. And yet whenever they bought anyone, once they moved Six Music, Five Live, up to Manchester, if anyone came up to do, a, you know, to fill in for a week or two weeks, they would actually pay for them to come to London and, and pay for them to stay. You know, so it's kind of it's really strange because yeah. it was the same thing. And you think, so you'll pay for someone for the inconvenience of going from London to Manchester for a week, and yet you wouldn't pay for the inconvenience of someone going from Manchester to London for the week. An element yeah. of arrogance, maybe. Just... No, I mean, I mean, it, it, it doesn't even cross their minds. I remember, you know, I mean, this is slightly off the but on the same subject, even when I got Oasis on the word, the big stumbling block was we already had a band from Manchester booked on that show. And they were going, well, we can't have two bands from Manchester on the same show, Terry. I said, so you wouldn't have two bands from London on? Well, that's different. I said, yeah, you've not had a music scene since punk in 1976. <laughs> you, know, you know, but just be real, nothing's come out of London. You know, nothing had at that time. You know, even Britpop, none of the bands were from London. They try and say Blur. Blur Blur's Colchester. That's 60 yeah, yeah, yeah. odd miles away, isn't it? That's a good point. That's like me claim, claiming some band from like York or from Manchester. Mm, Radiohead. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's shed, all seven. Well, Oxford. yeah, but they, no, they weren't Britpop, were they? Bristol they probably popped anyway. up more, didn't they? Well, they had the trip hop scene. Yeah, but what was the trip hop scene? Port is Ed and Massive, Massive Attack. Attack. Yeah, but Massive Attack were around before. Oh, crap. Massive Attack came out in. Okay. 89. 89, 89, you see. So oh, this is what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, yeah. I did want to bring up one final thing. Do you think there's anything that Starmer could do to make, I mean, PMQs look like a shambles in terms of how he dealt with the Diane Abbott situation because all he asked for was the money back. And I felt that was a waste. I, I, there, I think, is I think, there anything I think, he think you think he could do it, it's, to it's a really this situation that's been created because of the media it, it's, and the conservatives it, it, and... Barrage. Okay, it's a strange one to me. I mean, obviously, I've spent time with Dan Abbott. Did four four nights of getting drunk with uh, her and Wayne Sleep and Dan, is it Danielle Lloyd doing Celebrity Come Down with me. Great woman, but there is that whole thing where she might be a loose cannon. So although she says something that makes sense, she doesn't say it in the way that it's that clear. So it can be misinterpreted. Next thing you know, you've got headlines in the daily. Then there's lots of questions to answer. So I think there's that those nerves with him, you know, they're picking on her. They're always going to pick on her, whatever she does. You know, Laura Trock can get all her maths wrong, and she's like the treasury assistant, you know. Mm. But that's never going to be as big as Dan Abbott once making a mistake, you know, where she, you know her job wasn't wasn't about counting anyway, was it? You know, whereas Laura Trock's is. Yeah. And, it, and I so think in terms it, of what what Sunak can do, though, I hope Labour will do this. I mean, I'm not I'm. I'm not a massive Republican, but I'm not a massive Royalist either. I don't really care. It's it's a soap opera that I don't watch. It's just this thing that happens in the background that I don't give a real toss about. But we have this thing called the Royal Commission that's just part of our crappy little constitution. And if I hope that the Starmer and the Labour government will do a series of Royal Commissions on things that need to be, constitutional things that need to be changed. The way that Parliament works, the way that the, the, the electoral system works, the ownership of media in this country. It's very difficult for a Labour government. There's some things a Labour government can do and everyone go, great, they're doing this. They can do NHS stuff because everyone expects them to. They can do social stuff because everyone expects them to. But if you try to start trying to walk about with the military or with the royals or with constitutional stuff, they say, oh, no, 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 that belongs to the Tories. So I think he would find it de very difficult to come in unless it was a large part of his manifesto, which it won't be, um, it, it'd be very difficult for him to come in and say we're going to do something really fundamental to the country. But what he could do is say we're going to have a royal commission on the way these things work. I'm not going to be involved. I'm going to set it up, step back, it's going to make recommendations and then Parliament will vote on those. There are so many parts of the country that don't work anymore because they were designed in 1830 based on the decent chaps theory. Oh yeah, yeah. That when you elect someone to government they're automatically going to behave well. And Boris Johnson understood that and then drove a, excuse my language, because I'm not allowed to swear, effing girl, say, he drove a coach and horses through it. Yeah, I, 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 think I, I equated that. I said, it's like if, you rely, if you're a town and you're relying on an honesty box and yeah. then the biggest kleptomaniac going comes in. Of course. And that's Boris Johnson, that's the exactly what was, yeah. But But I hope, uh, Labour won't be given a free press. They won't be given a free ride. They won't be given a, an easy time. All the problems that have been built up for 14 years, within two months of Labour being in power, the press will blame it all on that. 
Um, interesting to see what they can do in 100 days. Why don't we just enslave ourselves with the EU and get as close as possible to it, I, I and then they can that, take I care of it all? I they can we'll, be our welfare until right. they go to the wall. Well, that's what I'd like to see is is uh, a um, a citizens' jury or a citizens' assembly like you had in Ireland over the abortion um, debate, where they, I think was it three hundred individuals they chose at random. They put them in a room together with a series of experts and they took evidence and they deliberated on it and they made a recommendation. And it took it away, it depoliticized it. Because yeah, it and I, I think that this would be a one, yeah, this would be wonderful for labor as well, because then they'd have then they'd understand what the public really feel. Yeah. So they'd, they'd be able to build policies around that. So they'd yes. say, OK, what does the Citizens Assembly think? They think we should do X. OK, let's build a policy around X. And well, it could it could actually guarantee them to stay in power for a lot longer than they, they should do that uh, about Europe. They should do that about electoral reform. They should do that about parliamentary reform and, and the way that parliament behaves and acts. I also think another thing that they should do is they should start introducing training for ministers, which we don't have. We, we don't have anything like that. We also don't have a transitional period between governments. In America, you, you have the election in November and then you have a two-month transition when the new government is able to put things in place so there's a smooth transition and they know what they're doing when they hit the ground and there's a handover. You, you don't, you know, if you get a new administrator working in your office, they have a, hand, a shadow day, shadow the previous person, see what they were up to. Mm. Have a handover period. But in this country, we have a vote on a Thursday and on a Friday, a new government starts and they're expected to make it work, even if they've been out of office for 14 years and no one's got any ministerial responsibility. So they should introduce that, I think, so that for future elections, we have a month gap between the election and the new government taking office, during which there's a transitional period. And when a minister takes office, they should have a month's training before they start. Because you can't, you know, they start on a Tuesday and on Wednesday, they're doing PMQs and answering questions on their new... And they haven't got a clue. They haven't got the foggiest. They don't know what the responsibilities are. And, and having secret meetings with people who say, look, we'll give you 10 million quid. You, you can do this. for 400 million yeah. or vice versa. So I think if, if Labour come in and said, the, there isn't anything in the, in the manifesto about it, but we think we're going to do this. We're going to introduce the same thing they did in Ireland with the, the Yarra members. You call the People's Assembly, had it? People's with, Assembly, yeah. Yeah. So introduce people's assemblies for large constitutional issues and depoliticize them because it's far too political. Well, so many people do. You know, even, even the knuckle draggers want first past the post. I mean, want to scrap first past the post yeah. and go for PR. Yeah. Well, Labour can't do it because if Labour do it, all you'll get is the Daily Mail and the Telegraph screaming about how unconstitutional it is and they're destroying democracy. But if, if Labour say we're going to put it in the hands of the people, we're going to choose 300 people at random, it's their responsibility mm -hmm. to choose what happens. As a representative, you should be his advisor, Russ. Get in there, send a copy of your book to Kay. It's only <laughs> sent by publisher. Publish I'll hold it up again for the viewing oh, public. Send one to Burnham because he's waiting in the wings, isn't he? Well, my oh, publisher yeah, sent a copy of this to every member of the front bench. Of the yeah, no. front bench. That'd be interesting. Oh. On that note, positive bye, bye. note. bye everyone. Thank <laughs> you. Right, brilliant. Bye hey, bye. Great, great to meet you, Ross. Big fan. Yeah, you too. Tune in next week for another exciting story from the files of Police Squad. Every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies, in the final sense, a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. This world in arms is not spending money alone. It is spending the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, the hope of his children. The cost of one modern heavy bomber is this, a modern brick school in more than 30 cities. It is two electric power plants, each serving a town of 60,000 population. It is two fine, fully equipped hospitals. It is some 50 miles of concrete. We pay for a single fighter plane with a half million bushels of wheat. We pay for a single destroyer with new homes that could have housed more than 8,000 people.